Hey guys, and welcome to uh, the eighth Learn Gothic through gaming lesson. Um, quick thing, um, gamers in chat, rise up and like type it in voice. You guys can like see and hear me okay. Um, I hope you can, because um, I really don't want this to be a situation like a week or so ago where I was chatting away and about things on the screen and there was nothing on the screen because that would be very bad because our topic for our historical tidbit topic for this week is in fact Visigothic um, art because I've I talk a lot about the Ostrogoths it's worth t talking about the Visigoths also and so you should be seeing on the screen now um, pictures from the Guardazar treasure um, and these are um, votive crowns and jewellery so this one, the crown, here is a votive crown for King Rechiswinth, and as you can probably guess, based on just the almost impracticality of it, these are not crowns that you wear, these are sort of like offerings that are made to the church, and this, the symbolism of the crown gets worked into a lot of early Christian um, iconography and symbolism, so the crown um, is something that martyrs gain the sort of crown of martyrs and halos in a sense so this is almost like a gift from the secular world to the church by a gift by king Rechiswinth um of this sort of beautiful gold and gold and gemmed crown and it just shows some really like high points of visigothic art absolutely lovely stuff um here also is a medallion which gives us a very it's a very interesting type of artifact that we start to get in the migration era so it actually does happen in some cargo cults around the world today where like western coins get refashioned into jewelry and this would happen in the migration era also especially because um the further away you got from Italy and from Byzantium and these sentences of Romanitas, the more that like monetary trade and the monetary economy sort of faded away, money became less useful. So obviously money would be backed up in terms of its worth by the emperors, right? And the further on we get into the Dark Ages, the more that you sort of have sort of petty kings and power being very transient, the power of any sort of king to ensure the worth of a coin was no longer a guarantee but what it was still useful for was as a a symbol of power and a symbol of wealth a symbol of romanness so you would have either you would have kings minting coins that would get turned into jewelry or they would take earlier roman coins and modify them to function as necklaces and such as we have in this uh, coin here from Livius uh, Severus, um, one of the Visigothic kings, and the spelling of his name with a B shows us the um, the sort of la vulgar Latin pronunciation that they used in Visigothic Spain. Um, here's another one, um, and most of these are from the British Museum because these are like little artifacts that I used to like go and walk by all the time because I would visit almost I would visit like once a week roughly when I was studying for my masters I loved it um so here's one it's got the inscription of Viva Sin Dale may you live with God so like a magical charm that you'd attach to your belt buckle which I find quite cute um this type of uh gilded radiate headed brooch um this is one of the few things that actually properly changes um when the Germanic speaking people settle western Europe um this seems to be a style very popular with the Germanic speaking people for reasons that, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, it's literally it could be as simple as a fashion choice. Um, most, the general trends that I've been telling you about in terms of what Ostrogothic and Visigothic culture was like was that for the most part, they just assimilated to the Roman culture that they were moving into. And um, they just sort of what was different was that certain elements that were already existing within Roman culture that the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths preferred got amplified when more of them moved into the region. And like we gave the example last week of um, Vinodaris was expert ex of Mabitius and how he, you know, he wrote Amulum, which is a Roman, it seems to have originally been a Roman um, staple, a Roman uh, food. And 
Vinodarius, unlike Apicius, sort of puts it with every single meal. So this might indicate a sort of Ostrogothic uh, culinary taste in the same way. Radiate head brooches, I believe they did exist um, in the Roman Empire before its fall. They they were fashion choice available to the Romans, but it certainly wasn't uh, as popular as when the Germanic speaking peoples moved in. So this seems to be a sort of Germanic fashion trend, essentially. Um, speaking of Germanic fashion trends, um, here are two Visigothic belt buckles showing like some really lovely uh, cloisonne and embossing techniques and I quite like these little animals we've got down here at the bottom um it's one of these things that reenactors do they they when I was in the reenactment society at Oxford there, there was you know we went to um buy fabrics and there was a rule that you couldn't have any sort of um design or ornament on your fabrics they viewed that as a historical I'm like no they had like pictures on their clothing god damn it um it wasn't just plain colours. This is terrible. Um, but yeah. Um, pretty little animals. Um, I showed this in the last l the last lesson on food. Um, and it is just a sort of a vessel or a sort of a cooking pan. And it says in the Lord's name, in the inside it says, in the Lord's name, admire Dale Church's handiwork. And the outside it says, it's got a quote from the book of Revelations, which is bit strange but there we have a lion of the tribe of judah's root conquers david hallelujah very weird stuff if you want to hear more analysis of what these inscriptions might mean you can check out the previous video um here is a fun one it's like a little bit of a tombstone of a visigothic priest and it reads uh gunde bebius famos dei vixit annos so you know gunde bebi servant of god lived for so many years um both of these names actually um Deo Cecos and uh, Gunda Bebius, they're kind of weird. Um, I mean, Gunda is sort of a prefix meaning battle, I believe. Um, Bebius, we have no idea. Uh, it could They could have been Vs initially. Who knows? Hard to say. Um, same here. Uh, Deo Cecos, no idea what the, it could be. Theo Cecos, just don't know. Um, could be gothic names could be latin names very bizarre um they also don't seem to match up to any other names that we have so who knows right so this thing here the ash burnham pentateuch um absolutely gorgeous manuscript it's all available on the um on the bibliothèque nationale de france if you go there and you type in ash burnham pentateuch you'll find it and what it is is it's a manuscript of the sixth century and its origin is hugely contested so it's um some people say it's uh from visigothic spain some people say it's from ostrogothic italy and some people say it's from even vandal africa so from all over the place but certainly like migration era um europe or africa and it's full of, it's a bible and it's full of these um illuminate these drawings in Contem of biblical characters but they're in contemporary clothing and it's basically you basically i mean these aren't quite speech these are um captions so it says here is where they offer their sacrifice and then it says here moses um i believe is built an altar from stones and he reads uh the book of the covenant to the people um so this is a scene from the old testament and what's really interesting about this is that we can see like let's you know, if we accept some of the scholarly theories that these are in fact Visigoths, we can see a lot of um, fashion tastes in the people present. And actually, we can see a, a fair amount of variety. So, um, oh, I wish I could zoom in, but I can't. But on these two guys here, look at them. They've basically got mohawks. Like, half of their head, like, both sides of their heads are shaved, and they've got this little tuft in the middle. Um, which is just amazing. Like, you know mohawks in a medieval stone decorative who'd have th thunk it right um some of the men have like uh not quite shoulder length hair but uh just hair just below their ears um a couple of them seem to have mustaches like this one here i think has a mustache um their hair color um varies between like ginger and blonde and brown which is interesting um and we can see also in terms of 
what they're wearing. Now there is a possibility that they are sort of copying earlier painting models, which is true, but um, these models seem to reflect, they certainly don't reflect Byzantine fashion choices. They would represent, if anything, late antique Roman fashion choices, which get mapped on to um, the Germanic speaking peoples who come in there. So what I'm saying, I suppose, is that these, the clothing that they're wearing, right? These, and what's interesting actually about these guys, I shouldn't move mouse because then it sort of took away the thing and you couldn't see. But if you look at their feet, they don't, they're they not wearing any um, shoes. The men aren't wearing shoes. The women are. The women are wearing shoes. The men aren't. Um, they seem to be wearing shorts, which I find very endearing. Like, look at that. They're, they're, their little bros turning out with shorts and they've got these cloaks as well so they're wearing like tunics shorts and a cloak that seems to be the standard male garb and the priests by contrast uh, by contrast are wearing these robes and they're dressed in all white now the robes are quite interesting so if we, if we contrast um the priests and their robes um to the women like the women are also obviously wearing um they they are wearing well dresses stole um the women also seem to have a kind of cloak a bit similar to the men and the priests. Um, the women are also veiled, and this would be a thing that married women did, so presumably these are the wives of the men in the image. Um, the women are adorned with this like Byzantine-style jewellery, um, necklaces, uh, earrings, much like we see in coins and in contemporary iconography. Um, some of them even have patterns on their clothing. We can see this woman here has these like uh, geometric designs on her under tunic. Um, sorry, on, on her on her dress. So we have we have like a quite large variety of fashion, and we also have a lot of different colours. It's a vibrant scene, and so this perhaps gives us a glimpse into what like Visigothic fashion trends and like just the their clothing might have looked like and I find it really cool I also really find it cool that we have mohawks <laughs> depicted from this time um so if any of you guys want to try it go ahead um here is something that's a bit more boring by contrast but it's um there's a tile from building in Visigothic Spain it's decorated with a Cairo and the Alfa Omega um and it's underneath a Romanesque style of arch, which is seen in pictorial forms in the Eusebian canons of the Codex Argenteus, and it's in architectural form in several Visigothic churches surviving to the present day, which is what we come to. So that same style of arch you can see here in this church, which is San Pedro de la Name, built between 680 to 711 Common Era. Um, and this style of church building is actually just basically Roman. So these churches initially were just modelled after Roman basilicas and the forms were changed very little. They didn't yet have the um, architectural science or technology to build larger windows like they have in Gothic churches, like, sorry, like, you know, proper Gothic, like high medieval churches, not Visigothic churches. <laughs> so this has quite a few impacts impacts actually on how the lighting works within it. You just don't have that much light and it really affects the atmosphere inside those churches. Um, and this is the last item here. Sorry, I should have paused on that longer. This is another church, but frankly, it's not that exciting. Uh, I just want to give you a second example. And here we are. Uh, this is my favourite. And this is the part where I invite you guys to give your perspective so this is um a horse girdle bit it's part of an identical pair and what it shows it is, is it depicts here a man with a spear and he is stabbing this monster up here um and the monster honestly almost looks a bit like either a manticore or a, or a sheep which yeah and this monster is being bitten by a dog over here and this dog hind legs being held onto by this person whose body is overlain with the the body of this long bird that's biting the man with the spear so we have we have like this really fascinating like rotating image of five um almost like a pentagram um of violence in this in this horse girdle and my thinking is that it might represent a sort of 
Visigothic legend that has not been recorded and has been lost to time. And yeah, do any of you guys have any thoughts, any interpretations on what this weird circle might mean, what it might signify? You can type it in voice as well if you'd rather, if you're shy to speak. I might have an idea. Go on, Arso. I I feel like I'm going to regret letting you do this, but go on. Well, so actually, I took a lot of classics courses when I was um, beginning college. Uh, I went to a small private um, private school. And in it, we talked about the fortune, uh, like the wheel of fortune in life, and like this medieval concept of like going up and down the wheel of fortune and how it's like not predictable and it'll always fluctuate back and forth so maybe it's related to that ah oh, i actually i really like that as an interpretation and actually you got a rip i think it's a very good point because um the many of the wheels of fortune normally have spokes on the outside and we can sort of see that here it actually looks like a wheel i really like that as an interpretation i, I, I thought you were going to make a joke but like no, this is really good. Um, yeah, I can totally see this. Um, the symbolism of the animals and the people holding on to them still needs to be explained within that. Because like, the Wheel of Fortune, from what I've seen, it normally has like people standing around it or holding on to it. And these people seem trapped on the inside of it. Um, but I, I actually think, I think that it's definitely got a Wheel of Fortune association and that's something that is, they're trying to get across. Um, Perhaps it is something like that, of like the sort of a, a commentary on the the vanity, the vainglory of these like secular, violent quests to slay dragons and all the rest of this. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, does anyone have any ideas about the sort of bird? Like the, like, I mean, it's it's almost tempting to look at it as this like half. I I like to interpret it as a dragon, but we don't have. We don't have any evidence that would lead us to that because unless we think the dragons had scales which sorry had feathers which in art they don't really um they also don't really have wings at this period they they're sort of like almost like snakes basically um and it's tempting to for me to look at these two at the bottom as almost like a sort of combined monstrous creature but it's probably not the case it's probably just that the bird's body is overlaying um this person there um I think certainly there's some kind of um, ideas about hunting going on here. This, you know, the, the man and his dog and with spear attacking this creature. Um, I think it's got something to do with um, elite secular hunting activities. Um, perhaps it's meant to be a commentary on that, like a commentary on the fickle nature of the hunt and how it's subject so easily to the wheel of fortune. Um, so, with us having had that scintillating, I hope, look at Visigothic art, 